Howard. Am, am I? I'm mic'd, right? You can. All right. I have my. I have two potty mics. Uh, thank. Thank you all for coming to this uh, on this beautiful day. I saw a lot of people as I was pulling in from the New Bedford campus, and they were unbuttoning their top button like. <laughs> on their way out. So I know that this is a sacrifice to be here, if not to be doing other work. So um, my talk is about how to create balance in uh, one's life if you're an artist and also a teacher. So um, I, everything I'm going to be talking about today is true. It really happened. It's uh, mostly storytelling and telling little anecdotes from my life. I want you to know that it is all true. I may embellish some parts of it <laughs> because that's part of Irish storytelling. <laughs> and I was asked recently by a friend when I said that, they, she said, well, oh, Irish storytelling, is that actually a term? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> all right, so, OK, so jiggle the hand. Um, so uh, essentially, uh, uh, I have many identities in my life, and one of them is that I teach. But I also make art, and that is not a picture of me. But I, I think that it's really difficult uh, to combine the two and have balance. So when you put teach and art together, uh, you get tart. <laughs> so <laughs> was that bad? <laughs> so it, it's often a very, uh, there's a lot of schism in those two identities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, sort of my evolving identity as a teacher and my um, evolving identity as an artist and see if I can put together something that has to do with synthesis. And um, certainly I, I need to start with an anecdote about my first day as a teacher. It was back in 1980, and uh, Paul Fletcher gave me a night class teaching freshman comp. And I walked into the class, and um, it was full, and they were mostly adult learners. And I had the syllabus in my hand, and it was shaking, and I started passing it out. And this guy had a panic attack. The, he just had a panic attack. And he said, I can't do this. I can't do this. And he got up, and he walked out, and he's grabbing his books. He's making this big scene. And he walks out, and he's like, I can't do it. And I was standing there with the papers going, I can't either. Can I just? <laughs> I, just, I was petrified. So I start, I pass it out and I start to sort of get my game back. And I'm sort of, hello, I'm Tom Grady. And, and, and I'm passing it out. And there was a guy in the back of the class who was like really behaving strangely. He was squirming in his seat. And he was making these scrunchy faces. And it was just so distracting. And I'm trying to talk about writing and being that great first day guy. And, I, I was just completely distracted. At the end of the class, he came up to me and he said, Mr. Grady, I'm really sorry. I was acting strange back there in the back of class, but I just had a vasectomy and it hasn't taken well. <laughs> I and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know where my brain should go with that. I just, cause I, I don't know how things don't take. It was just. Horrible, and I just sat there, stood there with this, <laughs> you know, and I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything, but he said something for me. And he reached into his pocket and took out a package of sugar and said, I'm a diabetic, and sometimes I, have to take, I forget to take my insulin, so can you hold on to this uh, packet of sugar in case I go into um, a, a diabetic seizure? Just give it to me in case I seize in class. So that's day one. So just like that's day one. That's day one. So I'm just a mess. <laughs> Flash forward to the last day of class. He came up to me and he said, "Mr. Gray, I just want to let you know. I thought you were one of the best teachers. You're wicked good. Thank you so much. I learned a lot in your class." Reached into his pocket again and pulled out this huge horse pill, and said, "I have to take these three times a day for my nerves." And he put it on the desk and went and said, I I'm giving this to you because I think you would benefit from it. <laughs> I still don't.
don't know what the pill was, but I went to a bar and I got lucky. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so given that I felt so insecure, um, and I think a lot of educators can speak to this who teach at the college level, is that in our master's programs, for many of us, we are taught in our disciplines and we learn in our disciplines and it's great and you gain all this knowledge but there's very little by way of teaching. I learned how writers' brains worked, definitely, but I didn't know how to teach. And so as such, I had to go through a series of stages in my own life as an instructor with different types of identities to grow. And um, the first one was I just really felt like an imposter. I just, every, when I walked into class, I felt like I wasn't worthy and that um, they were going to find out how stupid I was and that I really didn't know what I was doing. And it was paralyzing. And this really is a syndrome. And see, you may recognize yourself in this, but I certainly recognize myself. It is a psychological phenomenon in which people are unable to internalize their accomplishments. How many of our students are like that? Despite external evidence of their competence, those with the syndrome remain convinced they are frauds and do not deserve the success they have achieved. Proof of success is dismissed as luck, timing, or as a result of deceiving others into thinking they are more intelligent and competent than they believe themselves to be. And I, real, I, that, I was that guy. So I, I didn't really know what to do with myself, so I, I had different coping mechanisms by taking on certain identities, one of which was the grad school recidivist. <laughs> so uh, just to unpack that term, it means that you're so insecure, you're so insecure that you, you act super smart in front of your students and use graduate level diction just so they know that you, you, they're paying their money and they're getting their product. So you just, my, my, di my vocabulary got very elevated. And at one point I had a peer partnership in which the uh, person who sat in on my class, a fellow faculty member, would sit in on my teaching and I hers. We would not participate, but we'd meet once a week to talk about our teaching. And she said, dial back the SAT words, just a little bit, <laughs> little bit. And it was useful for me, it really was. Um, here's an example from a 2007 quiz from uh, the film class. Now mind you, I taught, <laughs> I taught in C111 a, a class very similar to this, and we didn't have these, we had bulb televisions. You know the tube televisions that were this big? So I'm teaching a black and white 1960s film in Swedish from Ingmar Bergman with the subtitles and all the students were like <laughs> trying to figure out. And it's Bergman. So I mean, you know, like plot free. And so this was the assignment. In persona, Ingmar Bergman taps into the viewer's subconscious. Consider some of our primal fears and desires. Death, sex, starvation, shelter. Side note, notice that like I put sex associated with fears and desires, as I am Irish. You know, we just have this. Uh, okay, how does he confront the viewer? How does he confront the viewer? What of our more socialized desires and fears? Isolation, love, expression, self-knowledge, and spirituality. How do, how do the film and the characters within it challenge your assumptions in these areas? And this was a quiz. This is sort of like <laughs> quiz time. <laughs> Pass it out. This one student just did a drawing of herself screaming. <laughs> So bad, you know, she was a good student, but she was just like, it was just, it was just like the, another student just kept looking to his left and to his right to see if some sort of psychic spiritual philosophy thing would leech off of the person from his left to right and just hand it in a blank. So I knew that that identity was uh, not working. Then I went through a little stage of the professor that can hang. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? This, you know, do I need to say anything more? I mean, it's just that uh, uh, I, d d the professor that just tries to be really cool and down with the students and use slang and whatnot. And here are some examples. This is from 2002. So here, let's take a little grammar quiz. 
can you correct the errors? And this was most especially hard on second language learners that typically are really earnest and literal. And to hear a student read, I have a problem with number two. I wear tight clothing and high heel shoes. It doesn't mean I'm a prostitute. You know, and hearing them, reading them aloud, and I'm just sort of, huh, this is funny because it's from anyone? You don't remember these groups? No, it's uh, the f free your mind and the rest will follow. Oh, 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 oh. Not Destiny's Child. <laughs> Moving on. Can you name any of them? Cosmo says you're fat. Well, I'm not down with that. <laughs> Sir Mix a lot. Anyone? I know someone who will get this. Well, it's time to change. It's time to rearrange who you are into what you're going to be. <laughs> Little Brady Bunch. Oh, yeah. You don't have to watch Dynasty to have an attitude. Prince. Prince, thank you. Well done. When I revisit this with my students now and drag it out and dust it off, they're like, what the hell? They don't know what I mean. um, Here is from English 102. I was teaching prosody, which is you know the study of met <laughs> metrical structures, and I started them off simply with words like Barney, Diddy, Fajizzle, <laughs> and refrigerator, and then I would human beatbox this song from Salt and Pepper. <laughs> so, and I would punch out the beats, and then I'd show them where the accents go. I'm not going to do it. All right, so. <laughs> All right, I will. It's my thing, and I swing it the way that I feel, with a little seduction and some sex appeal. It's accentual. One, two, three. <laughs> I'm just sitting in the classroom like. <sighs> All right. Um, OK, so here's um, sort of a snapshot of my other life as a writer. Uh, so th I am very prolific. I write a lot. and. Um, so at the same time I'm teaching, I use the academic calendar and um, late nights to write. So here, um, Howard mentioned some of the um, works that I've done. And here are the more recent works. And I'm going to spend a little time talking about Symposium, especially because that's a screenplay. And that's most recent. So you think, how do I, how do, I do this? Well, I invest a lot of. Um, time, if I can afford it, to go to art colonies. And I'm just going to make the assumption that people aren't familiar with what art colonies are. But they are very um, prolific in Europe, not so much in the United States. There are a number of them. But uh, since uh, European countries support the arts with their tax dollars and they see value in it, there are many of them. And in the United States, we value art very little as part of our um, uh, identity as citizens and civic, uh, our civic life. So they do have them, and these are residencies in which you live at these locations. And depending on uh, how they're set up, you are completely left to your own devices to create art. And all three of these art colonies were really great. And some of them you pay a little bit. You have to share a kitchen. You have to make your own meals. Some of them are completely free, and all of your meals are prepared for you. It's a great time to have fellowship with other artists and to live off the grid so you can really um, focus on your art and retreat from the expectations that are on you in your regular life. Uh, probably the most prestigious um, place I stayed was called Yaddo. And, um, it's very competitive. It's in Saratoga Springs, New York. And when I arrived, I had a consultation with the head chef of the four to talk about my dietary needs. And um, your breakfast is brought to your apartment. You also have a writing studio. Your lunch is brought to you. You're not disturbed. And then there's a communal dinner. And to go back to impostoritis, uh, the first communal dinner, I sat down in this gentleman across from me who was in his uh, late 60s 
was really pummeling me with questions. And he was very nice, but he was saying, and what do you do? Well, I write plays and screenplays. Oh, that's nice. And where have they been done? Just really peppering me with questions. And uh, when he was done, I said, and what do you do? And the rest of the table laughed. And it was Carl Bernstein. Because <laughs> I don't know what he looked I know him from the movies. It's like, you know, oh, so you're Dustin Hoffman? You know, from all the President's Men? So um, anyway, so that made me feel small. But um, there's a short YouTube that really talks about some of the goals that are, I attribute to what art colonies can do. And that's building your identity as an artist and feeling comfortable and proud of saying that you are one. And I think that's difficult in our culture. I just think that if you say you're an artist, people roll their eyes and say, well, what do you do for work? Or that's playtime. And when we took the tour, I took a tour of Yaddo when I first got there. And you know, it's 400 acres of swimming pools and tennis courts. It's just very luxe. And um, he, I, uh, it was so nice. And I felt very beholden to them to uh, do the right thing. And I said, what do you want from me? How can I give back? And they said, nothing. And I said, so you don't want to see the work I've done while I've been here? And they said, no, no, we don't want to see that. In fact, uh, I said, so how do you know that I'm working? And uh, he said, we don't. We don't. We just want you to feel like an artist. We want this time to be nutrition for you to internalize that you have value as an artist making artist, and if that means a day of doing nothing and just feeling like an artist, then we're doing our job. Not least of which is they had an articulation with Skidmore <coughs> College nearby, which is a very reputable um, liberal arts college. And it's as though you're walking into, the queen is walking into her court. Because when you do, when you walk into the library and you say you're from Yardo, the, Yardo they <laughs> You know, and everyone sits up and they just come to you and ask how they can help with your research if you're doing research. So it was a very privileged experience, no doubt. So I'd be in my normal teaching life, but I always had that um, battery that I could go back and plug into from the memory of being at these places. Okay, so that's kind of my writing life, teaching life, and how do I um, balance it? And for me, it's more about synthesis. And um, in 2006, I don't know if you remember, but there was a horrible act of violence in New Bedford at a gay bar where um, this guy came in with a hatchet and a gun. And it was a, a great deal of shoot violence. And um, I remember I was driving in my car on the way to BCC. And I was driving from Fairhaven to uh, Fall River. And I heard the news item. I heard it on the radio. And that day, I was teaching English 102, and um, I was teaching the short story Brokeback Mountain by Annie Proulx, who went to one of the art colonies, UCross Foundation. Anyway, um, the film had just come out, and it had not blown up yet as a big hit or anything. It wasn't really, uh, it was in the circuit a little bit, but not a lot of people knew about it. The students will have had to have read it for that day. That was their assignment. I didn't say much about it. I said, read Brokeback Mountain. When I got to class, so I was very disturbed by this news item. And I, when I came into class, the class of, at that point, it was about, I don't know, like 18. There were two students there. There were two students. And I was, I was very upset. Because I thought they stayed away because of the content. And it doesn't have strong sexual content in terms of graphicness or anything like that. I just think they didn't come because they didn't want to talk about a play that had gay people in it. That's what I thought. I'm not sure. And it was time to write a piece of work that was about my life and my work. So now I was starting to make a marriage of things that happened at Bristol in my teaching life and in my creative life. And you're all in it. 
Ha, 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 you and you and you. I ridicule you. All right, I also decided to give up being fairly pedantic in my teaching and start to infuse creativity and my craftsmanship as a comic and as a satirist into my teaching itself. So this is like a little excerpt from a lesson I give in English Own I Know primarily, and I also do it for college for a day, uh, about SQ3 arts, a study skills method. And what I do is um, I try to show the symptoms of stu uh, that students suffer from when they're dealing with textbooks. So for some students, this is the posture in which they read the book. And I ask, how many of you are in this posture when you read? And they all raise their hands. And then I ask them, here's an example of a textbook that I grabbed off of the internet. How many of you have started to actually read the textbook? You read every single item that's on the page. And when you get to the bottom of the page, you don't remember a single thing you read. And you feel like that. <laughs> now mind you, by the way, I went to Google Images and I put in, duh. <laughs> I feel so bad. Like I'm thinking about, you know, he goes home and he's like, hey, ma. <laughs> Guess what happened? My boy. So, uh, yeah. So some people fall asleep when they read. And my theory is, is that you are not falling asleep because you're overtired. You are not looking, uh, uh, reading to the bottom of the page because you're stupid. And you are not, um, what was the other one? Oh, yeah. And this isn't because the textbook you're reading is boring. It all has to do with brain-based learning. But in order to really sell them on that, I try to be as empathic as I can about my students and what it's like to be in their head. So I give them a mind map of what it's like when I read a textbook and I'm not doing it well. So, for example, in July 1845, Texas formally accepted an American proposal to be annexed to the United States. Annexed. I know what Xanax is. I know who takes Xanax. I know who looks like she takes Xanax. All right, wait, get serious, get serious. I have to read this. Already strained relations between the United States and Mexico rapidly worsened. President J.K. Polk ordered Zach General Zachary Taylor and his troops to Corpus Christi. In March 1846, under instructions, Taylor took up a position on the Rio Grande. On April 26, an American squadron of dragoons surrounded by Mexicans. Oh boy, dragoons. <laughs> I know what crab rangoons are. <laughs> are they just talking about dragons surrounded by Mexicans and it's a typo? I ju I'm just going to play a video game for a while that has a dragon in it just to get my... And I really need to change my avatar because I look like a very swishy member of One Direction. Let's just check my status on Facebook. Oh my God, let's put on the TV. Judge Judy is on Ellen. How great is that? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Oh, thank God someone's texting me. Hurrah. Yeah, forget this. <laughs> so that's my little example of try to getting them on board. Um, I also, <laughs> um, this would be a grammar quiz in which I stopped trying to be cool and I just embraced the world in which I was living. So this is 2012 and I was about to get married. <laughs> I was about to get married and we were trying to figure out how to like do a party favor, but do it DIY. <laughs> so I wanted to make these great uh, uh, river stones that had like our, our initials punched into them, so they'd be really pretty. So I made a whole grammar exercise about it, and I just want to direct your attention to the last sentence. So sadly, the river stone made of clay turned out looking more like <laughs> petrified dog poop. So nobody got a wedding favor at Grady's <laughs> wedding. So I went from imposter to straight up narcissist. It's just a world about me. Um, I was also asked to speak to the portfolio committee about methods of reading portfolios in a fast manner. So I uh, felt like an imposter. So I decided to create a professor that was a colleague of mine from California that was kind enough to send a video 
of his methods of <laughs> doing portfolio assessment. So I stood up in front of the English department and said, this is my colleague, and he's really good at PowerPoint, too, y'all. Hello, and welcome to the user's guide to expedient portfolio assessment. I'm Dr. Kak J. Wong. You can call me Dr. Kak. Or just Kak. I got my name when I was an infant. And my parents fed me scotch through an eyedropper. And it was a sound I made. <laughs> I'm a college graduate. You may know me from such textbook titles as I was born with a semicolon. Whose period is it anyway? And fuck you, old loud. Here I am at a conference with three people I met. They said I'm really good at PowerPoint. Here are some avatars I made for them. <laughs> so, without further ado, <laughs> let's go. PowerPoint was developed by engineers as a tool to help them communicate with the marketing department and vice versa. It's a remarkable tool because it allows very dense verbal communication. Reading portfolios in a snap? Yes, you can. Look for keywords. They tell you so much. <laughs> And bias helps. Okay, it all, it all goes downhill from there. So I'm going to move on. No. All right. Uh, another thing that I've done is um, I, I was at first reluctant to integrate my own creative work into my classwork because I thought, you know, if I teach four plays a semester and one of them is mine and one of the question is, which one's the best play? Right? Like, I, so what I did was, uh, this is a screenplay that's actually being made into a film in June. I'm very excited about that. And here I am receiving a Best Screenplay Award where they flew me out to Denver. And that uh, is very heavy, and it's in my home. Um, so here's an example of an exam question that I put, uh, since they read a variety of plays. You're an artistic director for a local theater company. You have to convince your board of directors that one of these plays is worth producing. Your primary claim is that the play has current relevance to your audience. So I have them do research before the test, and they have to bring in a printout of uh, an editorial or a news item. And they don't have to worry about an MLA because it's a sit-down exam. All right. And finally, um, I think what really helps the most with keeping balance in my work is that I rely on the patience and fellowship and love of my family, friends, and colleagues. Um, and I'd like to point out uh, my family anyway. I'm very grateful to have my uh, father here is, my father is here today, James Grady, and his wife, Sheila Grady. Please wave so they know who you are. And my, my sister, Catherine, and my niece, Olivia, and my sister, Martha, and not least of which is my husband, Paul. And I think that as family and friends, oh, Paul, give Paul away. <laughs> They, they have to be very patient with me because when I'm in a very creative place, I'm kind of crazy because I'm in the heads of, you know, these strange characters and I can get very possessed by them. It must be very un weird for Paul to be lying beside me in bed and for me to just wake up bursting in laughter. <laughs> I hope he doesn't take that personally. But also just sometimes with the business, and this is back when my mom was alive. We were having, I think it was Easter at her house. And this is when you had, um, you didn't have um, these. You had phone with phone messages. 
And I was obsessed. I thought I was going to have a play being done. So I was constantly checking my messages and leaving the party in the living room and going down to the den. And <laughs> I went down. And I was listening to a message. And it was from Anthony, my brother-in-law, who was at the party. And it said, Tom, please come back to the party. <laughs> But I think, I think it takes a great deal of wisdom and patience and understanding to know that artists need their space and their time and their weirdness to get their work done, especially when they're balancing two worlds. So I am most grateful to my friends and my family and my colleagues. It's the end. Are there questions? <laughs> explains what I've been doing wrong all these years. <laughs> I mean, pretty much all of it. I, did, I certainly didn't take you terribly seriously about um, you know, artist residences, residencies and things like that. I, I definitely didn't. Um, and I forgot that unless you've got a really supportive spouse, <laughs> right, that a lot of the things that are daily get, as my friend Les would say, to be too daily and yeah. uh, get in the way. And so that's one thing. Um, I also want to thank you publicly for many years ago, back when you were really suffering from imposteritis, trusting me and I'm sure a number of other people in this room enough to lend us your place and your time. Thank you. For our students. Thank that you. was always a highlight of my classes. Thank you. We have so many writers and poets mm -hmm. that, um, are a great resource for sharing in other classes. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Uh, oh, I think there's one slide left. What? Oh, how did that get there? Uh, this film is going to be uh, shot in the end of June. And um, it's a pretty big deal. It's going to have a crew of 20. And as of yesterday, it seems likely we're going to be, um, the lead actress is going to be uh, an Academy Award winning actress. We can't, I can't say who it is until she signs the contract. But that ain't cheap. And y'all know what I make for a living. So, and I know what you make for a living because it's public <laughs> record. So I know you have money. But you must know rich friends, please. <laughs> um, Deborah is going to stand outside with the little tear sheets. And please ask your rich friends. You can be part of it. You can be in the film. I have all sorts of goodies for you participating in uh, producing the film. I actually have to raise $5,000 by next week. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Ceremony. <laughs> so Jim's going to start. I will start the bidding at 1000 <laughs> I saw your salary. Yes? Can you tell us a little bit about the movie? I wish the I film? Was crazy to say, yeah, I got it for you. Oh, great. OK. So it started out as a play, and it is um, essentially about a woman, very wealthy woman, who lives in Central Park West. And she sort of sequestered herself in her luxuriant apartment. And um, she is very eccentric. And she needs to call a serviceman because her refrigerator has found its way into her living room, and she's not sure why. <laughs> so it's very comic, but it tears at your heartstrings at the end. I would like to call it Downton Abbey on acid. <laughs> so it's very comic. You know, it's very comic, but it's also absurdist theater. They have a shared, they have a shared grief memory that makes them believe that the world is hostile and indifferent to them. The refrigerator and, and the, the... The service man and the... Service the service... <laughs> yeah, the refrigerator is pissed. It's unplugged. <laughs> yeah, so that's... But thank you for asking. Go to the website. Yes? Basic question. the difference between writing for a movie and writing for a play? Right, thank you. Uh, you, uh, you have to think about a live audience and a very intimate experience. So you want to have them involved in the experience and have some breathing room in that script so the audience can really participate with you and engage in a way. Um, and it's so intimate. You have to make it about that it could be done nowhere else. 
And a film is all about primarily control. And writing for film is you are writing a visual and oral um, uh, painterly event that you, has, is very finite in time and sound and image. It's extremely controlled and doesn't have the joy of chaos that happens in theater. I, I don't know if I'm describing, that's how I think of it as, a, as an artist. Yes? Have you been fundraising on the Upper West Side? <laughs> oh, God, I never thought of that. I don't know anyone up there. <laughs> Actually, I should, there's one person I know on, on whom I, I didn't base it on her, but when I won this award <laughs> in New York City, the after party was at this woman's house, and it inspired, the space inspired me because it's one of those places that has a doorman that's in a green suit with gold piping. Okay. And when, yes, and when you go in the door and you say, I'm here to see Mrs. Smith, he says, just press three, that the elevator goes into her apartment. Yes. It's only serving the apartments on the Upper West Side. So when it opens up, you're in her living room. And I was, it just was awesome to me. There's so, yeah, help, help a brother out. <laughs> Talk to me. I don't know. Yes. Um, I, I liked your slide about being an imposter, but also kind of bringing in being a cool professor. Yeah. I think a lot of good teaching and being a good professor, being a good teacher, whatever you want to call it, is bringing some of yourself into that classroom. Yeah. And the, the trick is finding that line. Yes. Particularly in today's society. Yeah. Yes. Where do we draw that line? Yeah. And I'm just wondering in your experience, you know, being an artist and also being someone who's very outgoing, you know, yeah. really not giving a, a you know what. Yeah. <laughs> I should give a little more you know what because <laughs> the line has been crossed. <laughs> crossed many times. I had one student who was just this wonderful person. She was, all her kids were, um, she was homeschooling them. She very much lived off the grid. If anything had to do with media, she didn't know what I was talking about. She doesn't watch television, movies, etc. Very nice person, did very well in the class. However, when anything had sexual content in, say, a poem or something, she would literally go, please stop, <laughs> like that. But what could I do? But at the end of the course, I, I was just doing an in-class sharing evaluation about what you think of the course, what are strengths, its concerns. And she had kept a tabulation of all the curse words I had done throughout the semester. <laughs> you did three Bs, four Fs, you know. <laughs> So now I have my little mental ticker taper. 13 this semester. Just let that one go. 13. But yeah, it's hard. It's always hard. It's, sometimes it's just about engagement and showmanship. If I see they're wilting, if, I, if I'm doing, frankly, um, traditional industrial style teaching where it's lecture, I always feel like I have to do a tap dance. And then my note to self is, you're pushing too hard you should be doing better teaching. You should be doing much more interaction with them and not just the Tom Grady show. Because they're not remembering the content. They're just like, I can't believe he just talked about that thing from his personal life. Blog. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? No? Well, I'm very, very grateful that you all took this time out of your day. It means a lot to me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.